Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to start uh, with Bassam's session, and I just wanted to make a couple of, of small announcements. First is that in there is the Blender developers meeting. Uh, is that? Okay, it's open. Good. So if anybody wants to join that, feel free. Lunch today is at 12 till 1. Um, there's still, of course, we need sandwich makers. So if anybody has an urge to make sandwiches, feel free to go downstairs. We'll be very appreciative of your hard work. Um, yeah, you're going? Okay. I'll do your, your tutorial then. It's all on there. It's fabulous. <laughs> um, the speakers for today in this room, if you could meet me here at 12 o'clock, just so we can do any testing of um, uh, yeah, your computers, plugging in, whatever you need. Uh, if you don't have any specific technical needs, then we don't have to do it. But those who want to test something, to come here at 12 and, and we'll test it. I think that's it. Uh, for all speakers also, if people ask questions, could you repeat the question or give the microphone to the person asking the question for the stream? And I can use this one? This one is on, yeah. Okay, thanks, Basson. Hello. Um, hi, I'm giving a short or medium length um, sort of an overview of some changes that I've made to the um, uh, basic rig on Man Candy um, to go for some kind of cartoony animation as opposed to uh, the more realistic style rig that he used to have uh, last year. Um, the tutorial, I'm, I'm, it's not really a tutorial, but I'm just going over some ideas and I'm assuming a little bit that you know something about the, the basic rigging. So I'm not really doing a basic rigging tutorial so much. I'll go over the the basic ideas very quickly as I go along, but I'm not going to stop and dwelling on them so much uh, because I want to talk about some sort of new things. They're not really new in Blender, but there are new techniques to get the rigging working. So this is the old, this is pretty much the old man candy rig, I hope. Otherwise, I copied the wrong file to the USB key. And it's um, not really done to, you, to do um, cartoony animation. So for instance, if you look at the leg controls, you have uh, IK legs, and obviously you can move the body, and the legs only go so far, and once they reach their full extension, they separate from the target, and they just sort of point to it. So you can't really make them too stretchy at all. Um, the same goes for the torso. You can rotate these bones. Um, you can rotate these bones, but you can't really um, you can't really do any kind of motion with them. The top bone has a, a targetless IK, but it's still just doing rotation. Please ignore the nasty lattice on top. Maybe I'll just kill that modifier. Um, modifiers. And we'll just kill the lattice modifiers. Okay. okay, that's just so we don't have any ugliness. So, the lattice is kind of something I added on, but we'll go into that later on. Same goes for the arms. They're an FK, and there's not really any stretchiness to them or anything like that. And uh, the face is using the same basic face setup that we use on Project Orange, which is just um, bones that drive shape keys. And uh, so every motion is, is, is uh, driven by a shape key. And it, it works fairly well. Um, but there are some issues with doing that with, um, uh, not issues, but when you're making, building shape keys for a face, and you're building expressions out of lots of little keys, um, the problem is that when you add shape keys together, the result is additive. And so if you move, um, if you move a, a point to the right a little bit with one key, and you move it again to the right a little bit with the other key, and you're merging them together because you're making some expression that uses a little bit of both, then that point moves twice as far. And so you have to be very careful when you're constructing, when you're making the shapes, 
um, for the character that you're kind of thinking about how that's going to mix with the other shapes that you're going to do for the face. And oftentimes you have to build a few, mix them together, try them, and then maybe tweak again until you get it right. And the result of that is typically what happens uh, in the name of safety is you start moving as few points as possible to make each shape because you're kind of worried about what's going to happen over here. If, if, if you include too many points, then it's going to start to become a mess to deal with. And the problem with that is that you get a face that's fairly rigid looking, and then when you do expressions, very small portions of the face move around. So you get kind of a rigid, blocky looking animation. Um, and recently when I went to, and this is kind of the way, you know, to do facial animation that I'd learned for a long time, and I'd kind of accepted that. And when I went to uh, Argentina earlier uh, this year, and visited the Plumperos project, I found that they were rigging faces in a totally different way, in a much nicer way. Um, and what they were doing was um, they were using uh, more modifiers than just the basic armature modifier. I'll open the next Man Candy file, and we'll see what that looks like. Oops. Never mind this. So here's Man Candy in all his toony glory. I'll turn off this layer. So he's using a lot of lattices um, in order to do all this stuff. And uh, the lattice modifiers are building on top of the armature modifiers. So instead of modifying um, a piece of, of the geometry with just the armature, it's also using a lattice on top of that. And if you click on the mesh, and we'll look at the modifier stack for Man Candy, you'll see that it's grown quite bigger than just <laughs> the, the basic armature modifier. Um, so let's uh, go and look at his head. And so the old facial controls are still there, actually. Two layers for now. Um, where's the armature bones? Oh, wait. Didn't actually click on that. There we go. So let's turn on the armature. Oh, whoops. And turn on. So these are the old facial controls. They're still all there, and they still all work, actually. Um, I'll, I'll actually delete the pose for the armature so we can see better what's going on. So, and, sorry. Okay, so this is the same old setup that he had before. This is all using either shape keys or direct armature control. For instance, his eyelids are controlled by the armature, not by shape keys. And you can just sort of scale the controller to make him blink. Um, but things like the forehead raising is a shape key. Um, that's the middle forehead. This one controls the outer parts. For instance, scaling this scales it in, and it's always using shape keys. What I did is instead of deleting the old facial controls, I left them all there with all the keys still there. They're still in the rig. I'm, they'll probably stay there forever. Um, I made a second set of controls that's on this layer, and actually it shares some controls and comments. It's also got controls to lift the, eye, eye, the, uh, the eyebrows, but you notice it looks a little bit smoother the way it moves than the other one. This is actually using two things simultaneously. It's using a shape key and it's using a lattice at the same time. Um, if I turn on this layer, you can see this lattice here. And let's just... Okay, so we got this lattice here. And you can see that this lattice is deforming uh, via the armature. Um, the lattice 
has a bunch of hooks on it. So the lattice also has a bunch of modifiers. <laughs> However, um, when I did this setup, um, lattices could only be hooked in order to, you could only use hooks or envelopes to control them with uh, an armature. And so what I used to do here was make a, a hook for each bone, essentially, for the lattice. So, so each portion of the lattice is controlled by a hook, which is just an empty, and the empty is parented to a bone in the armature. Um, recently, uh, Tan added um, uh, uh, vertex groups to lattices. And so now you can rig a lattice with an armature via vertex groups without having to do the hook thing in the middle. So that's a little bit of a time saver, I think. But at this point in time when I did this, that wasn't there, so I didn't have that option. Um, so if we turn off, whoops, if we turn off the shape, it's just, um, oh, something is kind of slow about how Vista is drawing some of the stuff here. So this is the base. I pinned the basis shape for it, and we'll just see what the lattice does. The lattice just kind of pushes the geometry up and down. There's a little bit of an error with it, too, because it kind of collapses in on itself uh, at the same time. Um, uh, likewise, this pulls out this section of the mouth. Um, these are actually using a different lattice. So there's actually multiple lattice modifiers on the face. There's a couple of small ones here and here um, that do some of the closer stuff that's c coming smaller in. Um, the shapes adding on top of it add a little bit extra to the lattice motion. So they do a little bit of correction. And you notice the skin wrinkles now when you pull out the smile. And so that's the influence of the shape. So the shape is just being used to add the small detail nuance on top of the broad motion that the lattices cause. And so you can get much nicer and much more flexible things. I didn't lock down the controllers as much, so you can get actually a wider variety of shapes um, with this setup on Man Candy. Um, also, I added to him, there's also, let's go to the Google view again, because we're going to look at other lattices. There's also this big lattice here, which deforms the whole head. And it's also hooked to the armature. And so you can do. Um, you can do kind of easy squash and stretch with the head. Um, these guys here on the side can pull it out, so you can do this kind of, uh, you know, you can deform his head in kind of a global, squishy, jelly-like way if you want, which you don't do that. Um, you don't do that all the time, but when you're doing fast takes or quick motions, then you need to do some squash and stretch to give it a little bit of kind of like oomph and a little bit of believability. And that's the extra control that you do that. Most of the time, if Man Candy is just standing there, he's going to be on model. He's not going to be deformed. Um, the leg setup is also kind of cool. It's also using some lattices, obviously. Everything is lattices. It's the keyword here. Um, but we're keeping it a secret. OK, so here's the leg controls. And the leg controls, unlike Unlike the original man candy, they stretch um, as much as you want. So you can, you know, make his legs longer. But then I thought, well, the next thing was, um, OK, let's say you stretch his legs. OK, that's great. But like, what if you want them bent at the same time? So I added a little extra knee control that you can just manipulate directly and bend the knee uh, however you want. It's also volume preserving, so it squashes and stretches down. <laughs> and then the next level of control is, um, I don't know if any of you saw the trailers for Meet the Robinsons, but um, a lot of the Disney, this is a copy, the leg setup is a copy of Disney's setups for their 3D models, for their 3D characters. Um, because they often will want to switch, because they have such a 2D animation influence, they'll often want to switch from sort of normal arm and leg animation to sort of the old rubber hose style that they've been doing. And they're doing that a lot in some of their new movies. They did a little bit of that in Chicken Little, but they're doing a lot more in Meet the Robinsons. If you want, watch the trailer for that movie if you have a chance, because it has some really, really cool animation. And it has 
insane deformations on the characters and you can see how cool it can be. So one thing that they had is that I got really jealous of when I went to SIGGRAPH, um, which I saw in 2005 and 2006, they had the same setup. And I was really kind of envious of them, was that they could just grab a little point here in the legs and bend them however they wanted. So they could have this kind of leg that turns into a big bendy rubber hose if they want. Again, that's not something you do all the time. It's just, you know, in certain poses. Like if the character is doing a sneak, his legs might just go, you know, in front of him, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm going to show how the leg setup is done because it's actually the, the more complicated case. Um, the facial stuff isn't that complex. It's just a lattice modifier. Um, I do want to show something before I go to that. Um, um, incidentally, the nice thing about the setup too is that if you're not doing cartoony animation, you d just don't move these controllers and he m works pretty much the same way as a traditional rig. It's just only when you want that extra kind of stretchy, bendy motion that you need to use those controls. But I do want to show something kind of interesting is the order of operations matters when you're using the modifier stack. So let's go back to, uh, I kind of forget which layers I put things on now. Okay, so let's say, I, let's say I move the head like this or rotate it like that, just move it out of, out of place basically. Um, and then turn on the facial controller. Okay, it still works, but that's because the lattice is uh, lower down on the modifier stack than the faces. So you notice that the lattice modifiers are here and that the armature modifier is all the way down here in this case. And the reason for that is that the lattice... Okay, if I, if I do this, if the lattice modifier happens first, then what happens is that... It uh, happens last, is what happens is that the armature sort of moves the head out of the influence of the lattice, and then the lattice modifier does its thing, but the mesh isn't there anymore. So, you know, if you move the head, he sort of ripples through the smile and then it goes away. <laughs> um, so you have to do the lattice deformation first in this case. So like the order of operation matters. The way the modifier stack works, uh, at least currently, is that you have your base kind of mesh and it's an input to the first modifier in the stack, which changes it, and then that gives an output, which is the input for the next one. So you can't really mix them too well, actually, with each other. And so all of these cases that I'm using here are cases where you don't need to mix. Like the armature moves the head completely, and the lattice adds something else on top. They don't blend with each other, it just adds on top of it. And that's kind of the only really reliable way to use them right now. Um, there's some plan to do an upgrade to the modifier stack so you can blend things much more flexibly and we could do even more cool stuff. But that's not yet done, so. So this blend file has a very simple kind of setup to show um, how we build the bendy leg IK. It's just a, a, a quick, you know, one by one. And the way I've constructed it, instead of saying, here's, here's the final case, here's what, here's what we want, okay, now do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and you're done, without explaining why you did these things, I'm going to take more of an evolving aspect. So I'll do something that doesn't quite do what we want, and then say, okay, how do we get it to do something closer and closer until we get to the target? So the first basic setup is an FK setup for the leg. And we've got an armature, which I'll put in pose mode here. Um, and it's just got one bone per section of the leg that I'm going to deform. And the, the leg has an armature modifier on it. And it has, um, uh, sorry, it just has some, it has some weights for each of these bones painted on it. So I just like roughly painted weights for each of the bones because I, I, you know, I wasn't even that careful about it because I'm not really cure, you know, I'm not really too 
worried about this particular example is how it deforms. So, so when you rotate these limbs, it rotates in FK everything, and you know, and um, well, that's kind of annoying because you know if I get the foot in a certain position or I want it to be standing on the floor and then I move the torso, then the whole thing moves with it. So, yeah, okay, that's FK. Um, so the next thing, I s and the other thing is, everything is straight. You know, there's no, um, there's no real flexibility. I said, okay, like, what's the first thing I think of when I want to make things bend? Is that I just basically turn on B bones and crank up the number of segments. And so the first idea I had, okay, let's use B bones. So you basically take, you b basically take this, um, let's just do an example here and we'll go up to the next one. So we'll turn on the display of the B bones just so we can see what's happening. It, it really doesn't matter if you turn that on or not. And this mouse is terrible. Um, so we have a bone selected and simply by cranking the number of segments up, I can get some kind of a smooth deformation. And I did that for all the bones, and you get this. Okay, the nasty thing about this is, first of all, this is always bendy. It's always bending, so it's deforming the, the armature even in the rest position. And there's no way to get it to be straight. It's always going to bend. So you get this kind of permanent rubber hosey thing. It looks quite nice. It's using these busier, I mean, the B bones are basically busier curves internally. So it looks quite, quite nice and smooth, but you don't always want it to be bendy. You only want it to be bendy some of the time, so it wasn't a good idea. However, B bones are kind of cool, even if you're not using them for bend, is because uh, they propagate the twist down throughout the whole bone. So like, um, I'm gonna do the only example where I go into, um, where I go into uh, 3D on this one, where I'm gonna show you just mostly one side of this all the time. But um, let's go back to stick so we can see what's going on. Okay, so now, if I were to twist the calf on its <coughs> y-axis, the whole twist happens right at the joint here, you know, which is going to look very, very ugly if there's any twisting on a real armature. Um, the nice thing about B-bones is that they will t propagate the twist across the length of them. So you see that the whole thigh is sort of twisting around instead of just twisting at the knee joint. So you can use those B-bones uh, even if you're not using them to be bendy. Uh, you just have to ch kill the in and out vectors for them so they don't have any bend left to them. But keep, keep them multi-segmented just so that they propagate the twist. So all we're actually gonna end up doing with the B-bone is make sure that the twist is propagating down the length of the bone. So that, that's it for the B bones here. So, well, what's the next step is to go into an IK setup and, and, and not have to pose in FK all the time. So I've added um, a little IK target down here. And the IK target is just a target for this bone here in the, in the um, calf. So just, you know, if I were to do that, I would just go, you know, select this guy and just go tab. And basically, I just selected this bone, duplicated it, made it a bit fatter, and B bones are kind of. So, um, and I just like moved the, the end point down over here. And I kept it the same rotation as the child bo the bone I copied it from because I'm gonna actually use that later on to my advantage. So this is one thing where I'm kind of skipping ahead. So it's just that I made the target the same rotation as the, the little bone in the foot. So then if you go into pose mode, select this, select this, and hit uh, control I to active bone. Uh, IK cannot be the, oh, sorry. I, the one thing I, I, I skipped is to clear the parent on this bone. So clear the parent so that it's no longer a child of that bone. And now you can 
select, select, and control I to active bone. And that's all. So that's, that's all that you're seeing in the next step is, is that setup. And notice it's the setup where the leg does not stretch to meet the, the bone underneath it. It just goes in. And right now I'm not doing anything about the foot. So even though I have IK for the whole leg, the foot's kind of doing its own thing as a, as a child of that. So it's not really, really cool for the foot setup. So another problem with the IK is that just doing it like this doesn't guarantee that the leg is going to bend with the knee forward. So you can get this kind of flopping knee where it's going back and forth. So there's some problems with the IK. The foot's not doing anything. The knee isn't controlled. So let's fix the knee first. Um, to fix the knee, um, and actually I'll even say another problem with it, is that if I rotate this bone, which doesn't do anything currently, but it will eventually because I'm going to use it to rotate the foot. If I rotate this bone, everything's pivoting at the angle, which is good. I mean, it, it rotates at the ankle, that's fine. But if you're animating the foot and you're trying to do a heel strike on the ground, you want to pivot at the heel and not at the ankle. So there's several problems that I'm going to try to address in the next step. And so the next step, um, I can go to octahedron here a little bit so we can see, uh, wait, wrong armature selected, uh, octahedron here. So what I've done is I've added a little backwards pointing bone right at the heel and, and that bone is a parent, is it this, this bone and this, no, this mouse is horrible. Um, yeah, I can't even go there now. I don't know if it's the wrong pad or what the story is, but and I made this this floating bone here, and you can see in edit mode that they're both child ch children of this bone. So if I move this bone around, they'll move with it. So I just made this new bone that's a parent of these these of the original IK target and this little floating bone, and. This little floating bone has uh, two lock tracks to this guy. So this guy tries to track to that floating bo bone in the X and the Z axes, and like pointing Y, lo locking X and Z but pointing Y. So the, the, the Y axis, which is the length of this bone, tries to point towards this bone. And that gives us a way, that gives us a way to control where the whole chain is going to pivot. So if I move it here, it's going to go wrong. But so long as it's forcing it to point in front of it, then it's going to be OK. And it's a child of this because that's kind of convenient, because it kind of keeps the leg pointing um, in front of the foot, sort of. It keeps the knee pointing to the front of the foot. Um, it's not, I'll tell you now, it's not the most convenient setup you can solve for that problem. Um, there are better ways to do it, but they don't work well with the cartoony leg setup because all the other ways to do it involve u using a second IK constraint on this. And uh, we'll get into it later, but we can't actually do another IK constraint on this chain. So we're going to have to use the track two trick, and so we have to have the floating bone in, bone in front, which means that when you're animating, sometimes the leg will flip, but you'll be able to correct that flip by moving this bone, which is a little bit annoying. You just want it to not flip all the time, but oh well, at least it's fixable in this case. Uh, the only other constraint I added here is I did a copy rotation on this bone to this bone. So this bone in the, in the top part of the foot now copies the rotation of the IK target. And so when you rotate the IK target, the foot rotates with it. But the nice thing is that you can rotate the parent of the IK target and the foot pivots at the heel. So, so everything's cool and still not done. If you wanted to rotate the toes with this setup, you just have to rotate this by itself. Okay, I'm gonna just peek ahead and see what I did next. Okay, 
okay, so the thing is, the, the, the problem is kind of here is that, okay, you have a pivot at the heel, you know, but let's say you want to have him stand up on the balls of his feet. Um, then you want to take this bone and rotate it about this point, really. Uh, but the bone rotates around the ankle once again. So if I wanted to do that, I'd have to rotate this and then rotate this and then move this so that the foot doesn't appear to slide around on the ground, which is a pain. Um, so it would be nice to have a setup where you have a pivot here instead of having the pivot you know, over here. Um, and the easiest way is just to put a bone here that has its pivot here and use it to control that rotation. And creating that setup isn't too bad. You can just, we'll just select, select these two bones and we'll duplicate them. And for the ease of, of, of manipulation, we can take them and move them to an, a layer that we're not using. Oh, and whoop. And then we can go to that layer. So now we don't have everything else in our face. Um, and you can go to octahedron and you see where they're pointing. And we can just, um, we can just, okay, first of all, this is a connected child. You can disconnect it, or you can hit Alt-P in the, in the viewport. So now it's dis a disconnected child of that. So you can take this bone and snap the cursor to its, this mouse is gonna kill me. Cursor to selection, and just select the tip of it and do, well, before we do that, let's move this root away and, and selection to cursor. Now the tip's there. So now we have the, the infamous reverse foot setup, basically. And uh, all that's left is to change the parenting now. So if you go back and reshow and if, if you go, you can also like distinguish them from the other bones. If you go into B bone, you can just sort of um, make them a bit fatter than the bones we copied. So, you know, even in B bone mode, you can tell them apart. And then you can re-show re that layer and, and you make them children to the, um, make them offset children to the foot. So that's it. And so the, the next step is to say, okay, okay, now I have a bone that, that um, let's um, just rest everything. Okay, now I have a bone that rotates around that point, okay? Now all I need to get it to do anything is to get this bone to move around with that rotation. And so all you have to do is to parent this bone to this guy. So you just take this, click that, control P, keep offset. So we are going to a little bit of the basics. So now when you rotate this, the foot pivots there, but you notice that the toes are moving around with it and that kind of answers the mystery about why I duplicated the toe bones as well as the upper leg. It's just so that I could add a, add a, um, add a uh, copy rotate, sorry, uh, control alt C, uh, copy rotation. And so now there's a copy rot and you rotate this and that stays in place. So now you can pivot the foot on the ball of the foot easily and you can still control the toes, toes with this guy. And so that's the setup that we have here which is the reverse foot with the second pivot in the middle of the foot. So now you have a, a foot that you can do heel strikes with, and once you have the foot on the ground, you can have the character sort of tippy-toe a little bit. So if you're doing a walk cycle, you can do the, the strike down pose, and you can do where he's pushing off the ground without a problem. And so it's a convenient way to animate, since you don't have a, we don't have some kind of cool 
crazy system where you can animate where the pivot is live on the mesh. So we just have these built into the reg. And that setup is, everybody uses that reverse it, foot setup. There's more than one way to build it, but this is actually the best way. Um, because the other ways involve, um, I think some people use action constraints and some people use an IK in there instead. Uh, it's nicer just to use copyrights um, and parenting because the IKs will always have a problem with flipping at some angles. And so you, with, the, with the IK set up for the reverse foot, if you sp spin the character around, his feet will flip upside down. And, you know, and uh, the, I think there's a way to do it with action constraints, and that's just harder to set up when, you know, this is faster to do. So that's the way, we, that's the way I do it, because I always do lazy things. Um, the second thing is something I kind of added in, it's not really a step, is that you can add bone shapes in and do it early so, uh, because the, the shapes for the bones are simply that you can select a bone, this is actually a bone, and um, where is the selected bone showing up here? Okay, down here. And in this field here, you can type in the name of another object for the appearance of that bone. So if I didn't have that there, it would just look like, like a normal bone. But, you know, I created this object for it, which is just a tilted box, sort of, and put that name in that field, and now it has that appearance. And that's, um, that's kind of a nicer thing to do because you can distinguish your special bones your controllers should all have some, not all of them, but a lot of them could benefit from having some special shapes. And the nice thing about that is that you can give some visual recognition of what bone it is just from looking at it. So you can know that's the heel bone. I didn't give them too, too funky a look here. I just tried to give them a point where the pivot is for the bone so you can still kind of see it. So that's my heel bone now. And this, these are my reverse foot setup controllers. The bones that are still in stick mode um, aren't actually gonna get manipulated by an animator ever, so there's no reason to give them a shape. Um, and now as we work along, and let's say, you know, I have these bones all showing in stick mode. If I didn't have shapes for these, they would just be identical sticks lying on top of the other ones. And so even for rigging, it would be a pain in the ass. But so giving them shapes early just gives you um, makes, it, makes it simpler for you. There's no reason to put it off because the animators are going to need it anyway. So let's go to the next step, which is more curious. Okay. So um, if we go here, um, I, I can, um, you can also organize things on layers and you know, hide the layers that the animators won't see, for instance. And now you have a setup. This is the knee target here, reverse foot, and so this is like the animator setup. And this is like the original man candy at this point. So now you have a setup where the leg doesn't reach the target if you overstretch it, but it does try to rotate like it. And so that's the original man candy setup. So how can we make this, um, how can we make this stretch? You know, that's the first thing. How can we make it stretch to reach it? Well, that's. Uh, at first, it seems pretty simple um, because when you have an IK chain, you get all these parameters to play with for the bone that's in that chain. And so if you look at the bone setups, you see all these IK-related IK things um, like locking rotation in certain axes or limiting the rotation and stuff like that. But you also get the stretch parameter which says when it's doing the IK solution, it's a number that says how much this bone want to stretch as opposed to rotate to reach it. And that number is at zero initially, so the bone doesn't want to stretch at all. But just by adding a very small value to it, because you really want it to rotate most of the time, you just want it to stretch when it can't rotate to reach the target. If you set it to a really high value, you would get the bones just stretching but never rotating. Um, and that's not what we want, uh, which I can actually sort of uh, demonstrate just by cranking these up to one. And we do that for this bone too. So if I put them at one, then it doesn't really do the right thing. It just scales down, you know. 
But if we put it to a small number, and I put it to the smallest number, which is up. Oh, and I'll just copy that. By the way, you can hover your mouse over number buttons and many buttons in Blender and hit Control C and then paste the value into another box without having to type over again. So now it rotates pretty aggressively wants to rotate. But when it reaches a case where it can't rotate at all, well, then it'll stretch. And that's what we're, we've got here. But the problem is, in fact, there's two problems. Um, but the, the, first, the first problem we'll, look, we, we'll see is that everything scales up when we stretch it, okay? That's really not what we want, you know? Like, we don't want Man Candy's foot to get three times as big if he's stretching his leg, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of nasty. You can't control that. And um, the way it works, it just scales evenly in all axes. So you're... And, and, uh, Obviously, the children of the bones and the chain will inherit the size, so the foot gets bigger as well. So that's kind of, ugh. Uh, we got to do something else. And so what something else can we do? Well, we still need IK. We still need an IK chain. Uh, but we just don't want to scale in all of those axes. And because we can't change that in the IK settings directly, um, we'll separate the IK chain from the geometry bones that you ha we have right now. So we'll copy the geometry bones and we'll make a new IK chain. We'll copy all the parameters over to that IK chain, so that does the IK. And then we'll just constrain the original bones to stretch to the IK bones. So that's, that's gonna be our approach here. So the first thing is to duplicate the chain, which I've done already. And, you know, I mean, that's, just going into uh, sorry, that's just going into the right layer uh, tab, selecting the bones and Shift D, and you're done. Um, you probably want to, you know, make them a bit fatter B bones if they're B bones, just so you can see which one's which. Um, and so that's that's all I've done there. And these don't have to be segmented, so I just um, well we'll just go to the next one here. Um, I also put them on another layer so it's easier to select them. But I just turned the number of segments back down to, to one because these aren't going to do any direct deforming of the geometry, so there's no reason for them to be B-bones. So we just quit that calculation by turning the segments down. So we have this duplicate chain. Right now it's doing absolutely nothing. And we basically can copy the constraints over from the original chain. So if you go here and you zoom in, you can select this bone and then select this bone and do Control C and we'll do constraints all. And we'll do the same for these two. Select target bone, select the base, the bone you're copying from, Control C, constraints all. And so now you have an IK chain that's doing the same thing as the original IK chain. So, okay, that's there. And so now if I select the target, they move together. Okay, that's great. Um, what I'm going to do is, oh, th the reason this happened is that we have a we have a, no, we don't have a circular. I don't know why that happened. Um, I'm going to take off the IK on the original bones, though. So we'll go here, and we're going to delete these constraints. We don't need them anymore. Because we're going to do our IK with these guys from now on. So right now, nothing's happening at all. So we have, but so now we have to constrain our original geometry bones to do the same IK, to, to stretch to the IK bones. And the way I'm going to do it is um, add an extra bone, actually. 
Um, if we go here and here, uh, wrong armature. If you go here and here. So there's this bone here I added. If you go into edit mode, you can see that it's just, it's just a bone. It's just a little baby bone here. And it's a child of the new, um, the new IK thigh bone. So I just made this a new bone at that point. Um, and uh, when I went into um, the, the pose mode, I gave it a new shape right away just so I can see it more easily because otherwise it'd be this little bone sitting inside there and be kind of hard to pick out. Um, let's go to B bone so we can distinguish things a bit more. And so that's that bone here. And then I said, okay, this guy, the geometry bone, can stretch to this target. And so now when you move this target around, this guy stretches to it with a stretch to constraint. So that's the first quote unquote solution that we have is to have this extra this extra target bone there. So now you have a setup where at least the upper leg is responding to the IK, but when it stretches, it doesn't get fatter. So now we just have to do the lower leg. And the lower leg can be done by just adding another stretch to to, um, to the IK target actually um, in that case. So if you actually, um, if we show that bone, if you click this, this, and add another stretch to, now you have the right behavior, or so it seems. Okay, we'll see that's not really, so that's what we have here. Okay, that's what we have here. Um, okay, so is it what we have here? Yeah. There's a problem with that though, is that if we stretch this, if we stretch this out, um, you'll notice that the, the lower leg is inheriting the scale of the upper leg. And it's actually shearing because um, they're not, um, we can demonstrate, see how it's actually shearing because it's not even uniformly scaling anymore because the stretch tooth scales on the y-axis but it scales differently on x and y and because the rotation of the child bone isn't the same as the parent, it actually shears that bone. So it's really kind of too bad because now when we stretch this thing, you'll notice these guys are inheriting that stretch and shearing out like much further. So, uh-oh, that didn't work. Um, so I'm going to introduce a kludge because I'm not 100% sure that's really the right thing to do, but it seems to work, so. So here's the kludge. I added another bone into the armature. You really don't need to add another bone for this. You just need to have a bone that you know will never ever scale. And then you need to add copy scale constraints to the bone that's shearing. And because this stays at scale one, 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 so will this. And you can avoid the shearing that happens because of that copy scale. And so that's all that happens. Now when I scale this out, I've taken out the other constraint on here, but you can see that this thing isn't scaling up because the copy scale prevents it from shearing. Okay, then I re-added the constraint the second stretch two that we talked about earlier. I just re-added that and, oh, sorry, control tab. And I did another copy scale kludge for this bone here because that's another child bone and I don't want that one to shear because this one scaled. So it has the same copy scale to this bone which I called scale ref. So, you know, that's only there to be hidden and only there because it doesn't scale, you know. 
Um, typically, when I'm rigging, I don't make a special bone for it. I just find a bone and say, okay, I'm never going to scale this one, so that's fine. And um, it's not a necessary thing, um, but you can do that also for uh, the knee target bone because the controller is scaling up now when you, when you stretch the leg. And just because it's visually nicer, if it doesn't scale up, you can do the same kludgy thing where you add a copy scale to this too. Um, so now your controller stays the same size all the time when you're stretching the legs around. That's just visually nice. Because that bone doesn't deform anything, it really doesn't matter, but it's just nicer. So now we have a stretchy leg with volume control. It doesn't get bigger when we stretch it. In fact, it, um, because of the stretch too, it actually gets thinner when it stretches, which is nice. And we still have, an, and we have a knee control extra where we can, we can actually bend the leg. Or you could do fun things like if the character is jumping or landing from a jump, you can maybe have the shock sort of travel up and down, bing, 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 you know, like a little elastic band with the knee. So you have this nice knee control free into the thing. So the next thing we want to do is do the bendy thing. And I tried a lot of different ways on how to do the bendy thing, and they all didn't work. And finally I said, okay, the only thing that really, you know, some of them worked, but the deformation looked really bad. Um, the, the curve did not look nice at all. I said, well, really, the only thing that is nice enough is Bezier curves, that it's actually good. So what I did was I added some curves. So we'll go into wireframe mode here, and we'll zoom in. And you'll see that there's a curve here and a curve here. And um, let's just delete this modifier, and I'll re-add it. What I did was when I edited this curve, I just basically added a curve and rotated it into place and edited the points around so it kind of lined up with the leg. And you can select these, these end effectors here and you can hook them to an empty. Just, you, I just control selected the empty and you can do control H to the selected object and now you have a hook and if you get out of edit mode, now you can bend that curve around. That's kind of what we were doing with the, with the rig. So now you have a curve that you can bend. The problem is, OK, how are we going to actually affect the mesh with that curve? The first thing that comes to mind is, hey, I'll add a curve modifier. Um, so I'll add a curve modifier. And remember what I said about modifier order, it should happen before the armature modifier. So I'll just um, copy the name of this object, control C, and paste it into the modifier. Whoa, it's going around. OK, so the, the, the leg isn't pointing on the right axis. That's easy enough to fix, is that you can change a track. Oh. OK, now what's happening? Well, it's, it's working. Here's a modifier. Um, but something's wrong. I don't know what it is right now. And OK, that's, this is really happening right now because I have curve stretch on that curve. So I'll turn off curve stretch. OK, but now it moved down the curve path. And um, because it doesn't have curve stretch, it'll kind of slide around along the curve as you deform it. And even if I move the curve around to get it in the right place for the upper thigh to deform, then when I added the second curve for the lower one, that wouldn't work. And, um, and there's no real good way to fix that. You know? So it's like, ah, can't use a curve modifier. Crap. So, so delete the curve modifier. And then hmm, maybe I should delete the curves. And, well, maybe not. Um, We'll try putting an intermediary between the curve and the mesh. And so we'll use Blender's secret extra special feature, which is, um, which is, this is Blender's secret weapon. 
and its lattices. It's not Z blobby mesh spheres. We, we were considering hiding the fact that we were using lattices for everything and pretending that we're using some extra special feature. But um, it's kind of funny because lattices are ancient in, in, in Blender code, and they haven't really changed that much since their use, but they're, they're still very useful. And um, the nice thing about using lattices instead of a direct modifier is that we can build the lattice and the curve um, using cursor snapping or whatever um, to be exactly the same length. And um, uh, the way you do it is that you put the lattice in roughly where you want the curve to be, and you can scale the lattice uh, non-uniformly on, you know, so I can do, you know, S, Z, Z, you know, scale the lattice around non-uniformly until I like its size, and then snap the cursor to the endpoints of the lattice and make sure that I snap the curve endpoints to be sitting right there. Because the nice thing about that is once I do that, I can go ahead and, oh, sorry, I'm already, I can go ahead and use curve stretch and the lattice won't get any longer or shorter because it's already the same length as the curve. The reason curve stretch is nice is if you don't use it and then you start uh, deforming the curve, the lattice will you know, keep its old length and sort of slide up and down the curve and you just want it to match the curve really. And so curve stretch is the right, right way to go. It's in the curve edit buttons. Um, so having done that, now you have the lattices behaving right. And the nice thing is that lattice modifiers are a lot more friendly to apply to a mesh than curve modifiers are. So we'll, once, having once modified the lattice with the curve, oh, by the way, um, adding a curve modifier to the lattice is exactly the same thing as adding it to a mesh. You just add the modifier and you put the curve name in the modifier field, object field, and you're done. So it's, it's, it's no different from adding a modifier to a mesh. So now we have lattices, and the lattices act like the curves act. So we can use a lattice modifier on the mesh, and we can get we can get what we want. We can get the nice, um, the, the nice curvy deformation on the mesh without having to use a curve modifier. Um, by the way, um, these curves are actually just 2D curves. And um, you know, when I built, you know, in this case, we're working in a plane, so it doesn't really matter. In the man candy rig, I actually have the controllers to locked to only move on those axes. Um, uh, you have to be careful when you're using curves for rigging because curves, especially when they're vertical like this, um, have a nasty habit of twisting sometimes. <coughs> and um, so, so sometimes you'll have a curve and you'll be deforming it and then one half of it will twist around 180 degrees. And that'll twist your mesh and, you know, too bad. You can't do anything about it, actually. Um, so uh, using 2D curves is better if you, if you know that you're only gonna be doing the bendiness thing in, in the 2D axes. So that's kind of what, you know, that rubber hose is always going in kind of the plane of the leg, so to speak. So it's not really a rubber hose where you can yank the eggs sideways like that. It's always, you know, in the same kind of plane that the leg is in. So it's just a 2D curve. So we add the modifier to the mesh and once again, I'm reminding us that modifier stack order matters. Um, and I can actually demonstrate that here pretty easily. So now the mesh has these two modifiers. And there's one thing I'd like to point out here is that, um, is that you want to have a vertex group to limit the modifier influence. Because otherwise, uh, sorry, control tab, okay. Otherwise, if I select this and there's no vertex group influence, you notice that the lower leg, here I'll turn this on so you can see, that the lower leg is getting <coughs> deformed by the lattice too. And so what you do is you go into, um, um, you basically go into edit mode and add, just add a new vertex group and either assign the points to it directly or just go into weight paint mode and paint it in, um, so, so here's the vertex group painted here, and this is the influence 
group for the lattice. And I gave it the same name as the lattice for convenience. And um, just go ahead in the modifier field and um, you know paste that vertex group name in so that when you deform the lattice, it only affects the geometry that you want it to affect and it doesn't spread to the rest of the mesh. You don't want his face getting squished when his legs are bending, for instance. Um, I did the same exact thing for the lower lattice. And so now we have these bendy legs. Um, that works. And OK, this is a good illustration of that modifier stack being important. Because OK, let's say I do this. OK, that bends the leg. And then I do this. And the leg stays bent in the same way. And I can influence it while it's deformed by the armature. And even though the lattice is over here and the mesh is over here, it's OK. Because it's first in the modifier stack order. So when Blender's calculating it, the first thing it's doing, it's applying the lattice modifier bend. And then it's applying the armature modifier second. And if the order was reversed, so if I take this armature and I pump the modifier up in the stack, you notice that it's not doing quite what we want anymore. Because now the lattice is over here and the mesh is over there, and it's doing the mesh deform first. So the modifier stack order, and as you move this, it'll sort of ripple in. That's what I meant by this kind of wave thing. As it goes in and out of the lattice, it changes the influence. So that you don't want that. And this fix is really simple, just. Oops, sorry. Make this the last deformer. And the order for the lattice modifiers doesn't matter because they're not sharing any points in common. That's another thing that I'd like to point out is, as it is, make sure that you don't need to kind of blend between different modifiers. In other words, those lattice modifiers probably shouldn't really share points in common, actually, and try to blend some kind of effect between them. Because that doesn't really work as you'd expect too reliably. Um, because of the way the modifier stack is, and it's feeding the output of one into the input of the other. So it's not really that good. But adding on top, where we're adding some bendiness on top of the armature motion is fine, because we're not actually blending anything. So the only thing left is, to do in the setup is that we don't really want to control, we, we don't want to do the animation with a bunch of empties. Um, so we need to get that under the armature control. And the simplest thing in the world is to add two bones. Which, see, see this is the importance of bone shapes because these are hard as hell to select right now. And parent, you parent the uh, hooks, the empty hooks to that bone. And so now you have these two bones in the armature that are parents for the lattice. And um, they're still, it's still not so nice. Why do I not add shapes in that step? Okay, I did it in the next step. See, what, what I could do here for these two is just um, copy this shape to these guys. Uh, the reason I didn't add shapes to them is because these aren't actually going to be the final controllers. But that's fine, just so we can see them right now. So you can see that they work, and you can also see that they still stay behind because they're just, they're not parented to anything. And you don't really want to parent them to anything either, because if you did parent them to this and it pulled this out, then it would bend the leg, it would curve the leg every time you moved it, which is not what you want. So you can't just parent it here, because that would just deform the lattice for you. But you can have a controller here that rotates with the leg. Um, all you have to do is add two extra bones that are exactly the same as these, but they're parented to these, and use lo local copy location. Um, constraints because the local copy lock um, doesn't attach this bone to that bone. It just transforms it in its own space the same way the other is transforming. And so that's the setting setup we have here. So we have local copy locks. 
to be. So now we have this. And I'll go ahead and show you how that's done just, just so we can have. Um, so what you can do is you can select these bones in edit mode. You can copy them. And let's say I banish them to uh, this layer over here. And then I'll take this bone, this layer here, and I select this bone. So s I'll select this, turn on this layer, select this, and make that parent of that. And I'll do the same thing with this guy. So let's go out of edit mode and see. So now you can see these bones. Let's give them that nice shape that these bones have just by copying it. So we can see them. And then, right now, these don't do anything. But if you just um, select this guy, Control, Control, Alt, Control. Oh, way, weird. Uh, now, Alt, C, OK, here we go. Uh, copy location. And you notice it jumps there. OK, you see what I mean, how it, it bends it by default if it moves with the bone. So if you go to the copy location constraint and you click on the little local button, now it doesn't jump there, but if you move this, this one moves in the same way. Which kind of makes your eyes swim a little bit to look at. Okay, let's leave that alone. So that's the setup we have here. And then if we just hide all the lattices because we're not going to use them for anything, then we have then we have our bendy leg set up. So that's it. So that's it for the setup, at least. Um, we have a few we have a few minutes left, and I want to go over the rest of the rig, um, and I'm going to point out things that are there, um, but I'm also going to point out uh, where I want to go with it next, because this isn't actually the final form of that rig. Um, my plan is for the Man Candy rig, I'm going to actually uh, post it, post the cartoony version of it online sometime soon after the conference for people to download. The original version of it that wasn't a cartoony setup got posted on the Orange website during Elephant's Dream because I used the Man Candy rig at that time to test some rigging ideas before we rigged Prug and Emo. So Prug and Emo have Man Candy's rig actually. Um, and he is a public domain character for people to use for practice animations or to dissect and copy rigging techniques to their own models. Um, the cartoony version isn't done yet, uh, but it's usable in its current form. And uh, I'll post it for people to play with and so they can tell me bugs about it. And um, uh, everything I'm doing right now is always with CVS versions of Blender. And so none of my rigs are guaranteed to work with the release, but they're guaranteed to work with current CVS. And so I've made a sort of a plan that I'll release Man Candy every time Blender gets released. So he'll get a version with a Blender release, um, and that's guaranteed to work with that release of Blender. And then I play around, and, and then the next release, you get something that's guaranteed to work with that. And um, I'm not promising that he's ha gonna have all the features I wanna put in him by the time Blender is released, but at least he'll be working and he'll have some of those features. Um, so if we go back to Man Candy's rig, I can, I can show you what's kind of left to be done. Okay. So what's, what's left right now is um, the arm setup is still kind of a work in progress right now. Um, 
We'll also show you some of the other stuff he has. Um, so, bink, okay. So, the arm setup, let's see if I can find it. I hid it somewhere. Very sneaky of me. Oh, here it is. So the arms are an FK, and they do have the bendy, the bendy thingy going on in it. Um, but they don't really have a very good scale control right now because they're just purely an FK. And so when you scale it, you know, they inherit the scale, scale down the chain. And so I still need to separate the, the FK control bones from the geometry bones, the same way I did for the IK. So that's something that's left to do on this. So I need to make another, th so that the arms are gonna get three sets of duplicated bones. They're gonna get an IK chain. Well, maybe I can use one for both the IK chain and the FK chain, but they're gonna get another chain made for them just like the legs did, and they're going to use constraints to that so that I can have scaling working um, in fact, I will need three sets of bones for, 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 for the arms because in FK, you'll need to scale this and this individually so they can't be parented to each other. They have to be copy-locked to each other. So you'll get control bones that look like the arms that you can scale and the arms will stretch to, to, to meet that scale in FK. And then in IK, it will have the same setup as the legs. Um, and the, the problem that I want to point out is that IKFK switching will become a nightmare for animators uh, because typically, let's say you have only one IK constraint, you can switch that on and off and animate its influence. Okay, that's fine. But let's say you have two constraints to do the IK. Okay, that's adding the complexity. I'm gonna have six or eight constraints that have to change between the IK and the FK mode at least. And so you're gonna have to track that for each arm. And you have to make sure that the IPO curves for those are always matching. Um, and um, uh, part of this, uh, me mentioning this, is like to see if any Python coder is interested in collaborating with me on this rig for the future version. Um, if no one is, I'll probably script it myself but the plan I have is uh, to make a script uh, for IK switch, FK switching that's just a button press. And it will handle doing all the, 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 the keying of the curves behind the scenes. It'll know which constraints to turn on and off. It'll do it for each arm separately. And the idea is, um, let's say you're animating in IK mode and you want to switch to FK then it would basically find out what the rotations and scales of all your bones are from the IK constraint. And then it would apply those transformations to the FK bones and then switch the constraints around so that you wouldn't get any jump on the switch. Um, and it would do the same thing going to FK, to IK from FK. In this case, it would look at where should the end effector be so that this chain doesn't move at all and move the end, end effector there, key it there, and then switch the constraint. And it can probably have a button to tell you if you want to key the switch or not. And it can probably, I, I think the API is there where it can detect if there's any IPO curve on those influence um, and then there's constraint influences that it will have to key in those cases. Um, so the idea is to do it with a script and then you can switch between IK and FK easily with the, with the arms without having to go through a, um, a, a sort of a mini nightmare each time you do it. Because um, from experience on, on, on previous animations in, is that um, if IK, FK switching is too cumbersome, it's almost better not to use IK at all than to bother with all that crap because your animation will suffer for it as you have to switch modes constantly between like trying to animate and then like figuring out these constraints. Um, it kind of blows your kind of concentration and it, it makes you really like hesitant to make changes because you're afraid that you're gonna have to animate the constraints again. And um, 
like during Orange, there were a lot of situations where we should have been animating the arms in IK because the character was touching something else. But instead, we just animated an FK and like keyed every frame so it stayed there because that was easier than switching the constraints. And we only had like three, and this will be worse. So I, I don't think it will be switchable realistically unless we do some scripting for it. And there's lots of more cool scripting that can be done for the armature uh, as well because um, we can hide, we can use layers. We, we, I'm already using layers to organize uh, the armature, but the problem is that the layers are just these unlabeled buttons that don't tell you what they are. So you kind of have to click around to find the right thing. And one thing that we did do during Orange that we had a script that was a layer manager that had named bone layers, and so you could select the group of bones that you wanted to work with, and it would hide those layers or shift select them. And um, uh, you could combine those two scripts, and you can combine that with IK, FK switching, so that the IK bones get hidden when you're in FK mode, and the FK bones get hidden when you're in IK mode automatically without you having to do anything. And so that would also make it easier. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of extra things that are in the rig right now. Also using lattices, there's a shear bone for the hands here. And the idea is if you're doing a really rapid motion and like the hand is going whoosh, like that, where you can do the bendy thing with the arms, but you can also shear the hand so it goes whoosh, as you're moving it. Um, it's not really a very precise control. It's, in, it's, it's almost like physical <coughs> motion blur in a way. So. Um, that's there. And um, uh, probably at some point, I'm going to give the face bones in the second layer um, um, some shapes so that easier to recognize. So that's it for cartoony features. Oh, there's one more thing um, that Man Candy has right now. And that's probably going to get better later on. The, the, the torso bones have shapes that tell you what they do. If they're circular, they rotate. And if they have a square and a circle, then they both rotate and translate. This is kind of the upper body control bone. It moves everything with it. And this bone used to just rotate in the previous version. And uh, all I've done is unlock it so you can actually move, you can move it around so you can kind of stretch his body or, or squash it a little bit. It doesn't do any volume control right now. And this isn't exactly how the, to the final torso is probably not going to end up like this in the end, but right now this is a good enough approximation. Um, the mesh on this version of Man Candy is pretty much the same as the old Man Candy mesh. I had to add some loops into his arms and legs because now they're deforming a lot more. They have to hold that deformation. Um, uh, unfortunately, because of that, I lost some of the shapes, um, some of the correction shapes that I had done in his hips and, and butt area when the legs were moving around. Uh, because I changed the geometry there, I had to get rid of those shapes. And so his hips deform worse than the original man candy right now because they haven't re-added those shapes. And I'm kind of still in, the, still in development mode with the rig, so I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to fix the deformation there. I might do something else. Um, you know, I could add a lattice on top and, and, and drive the lattice instead of driving the mesh and use the lattice to fix the deformation. So I haven't quite decided how that's going to work right now. Um, but he's usable and poseable and whatever, and, you know, so people can play around with him. And that's it. Anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, when, I, when I saw how you made all this rigging uh, with all this uh, extra stuff in it, uh, 
I came up uh, with three things that I saw were needed. It was uh, flipping bones, the direction of bones, just a function that is always usable, and, um, and um, you adding inverse constraints, so that you co copy not the constraints, and I copy an inverse constraints, mm -hmm. and uh, making B bones like Bezier curves to make uh, it this, this part is linear and this is uh, a Bezier. Maybe it could be make uh, such things much, much, much easier to do this, uh, I mean, think this is three things that's really needed and to make this okay. more easier to use. So, and it is uh, not a special feature, it could be uh, used all over with uh, rigging and so. You mean like uh, rigging features in Blender that we Yes, yes, so yeah. it could be three things of rigging features yeah. that could make such yeah. thing very easy. Yeah. Actually, well, you're, more right easier. <laughs> you're right about flipping bones because right now you have to snap Yes, you know, yes, select, snapping, snap, 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 snap and to, to if rotate If you had it. a flip bone and yes. you flip the head and tail, just to click it, that flip would it be the direction. fast, yeah. And that's something you end up doing quite often when you're rigging, is having to turn bones around. So, yeah, that's, that, that is kind of cool. I guess you could rotate it too, but, you know, I always do the snapping thing. But, yeah, that's cool. Okay, Thanks. good one. <laughs> that's a good question, actually. Someone saying, hey, you need these features. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Um, now is.